Today, as we read the Christmas story, we'll be reading from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, and then we'll read from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And you know, um, I thought about um, what to do today is a special day, and Christmas being on a Sunday. And there's so much going around about whether or not, you know, Christians should, should celebrate Christmas and those kinds of things. And uh, I'm going to challenge you at the end of this sermon with something around that. <clears throat> the Hebrew meaning of Christmas is actually more accurate than the English word. And it means... Festival of the birth. Festival of the birth. And that's what we're going to look at today. So let me read to you. Since there were no children at my house last night, I get to read to you today. We used to do that every Christmas Eve. And sitting around the fireplace. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not! For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly... There was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. 
when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Now you hear the story. And the story seems to be rather simple. You have a child uh, in a very crowded place being born No room for them to get a, a room in any of, the, any of the motels and inns. And so they have to wind up putting Mary in a manger with hay where they, where they keep livestock. And there baby Jesus is born. The most blessed place on earth was a manger that night. And so today, Christmas Day, we celebrate the birthday of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And, and, and you know, let, let, let me just kind of say this before we get started. This is not a, a, a simple story. I mean, it's simple to read it. It's simple to listen to me read it to you. But, but underneath the fabric of that story is, is amazing things. It, it's not a myth. It's, it's not something that, that somebody thought, oh, I think I'll write a Hallmark movie and call it The Birth of Jesus. That's not it. That's not it. This really happened over 2,000 years ago. And, and, and it was the most remarkable night ever throughout history. The most phenomenal, fantastic things happened that night. And to put it simply, a baby was born. A baby cried but the significance of that cry is this it changed everything for all eternity eternity was impacted because this baby cried so in the stable in this little town of Bethlehem the the baby that was God passed from a virgin's womb into humanity, and into history. A child was born. A child was born, a son was given, a Savior came down from heaven, and the earth received her king. That's the reality of it. And, and, and we've never gotten over it. You, you, you just think about that for a moment. His name was Jesus Yet the world has never gotten over it. Even those people 
who say they don't believe in Jesus, who say there never was a Jesus, who may even call themselves atheists. If you say the name of Jesus around them, why is it that they get so mad, so irate, ready to fight you? Huh. It's because he's real. So I've got some questions for you. Why did Jesus come this way as a baby? What if Jesus had chosen to descend from heaven as a fully grown man? What if he simply appeared at age 33 and said, I'm going to die for your sins? Why did the sovereign God of the universe decide to bring the Savior of the world to us through this process of, of supernatural conception and natural birth? Why? Everything about the gospel of Jesus Christ is wrapped up in those questions. And all the answers are in God's word. And I'm going to share some of those with you. I've got five quick points that I just want to share with you to, to hopefully cause you to think. And the title of the sermon is this. What child is this? What child is this? The first point is this. Jesus came as an infant. Jesus came as an infant. What child is this? What child is this? First, Jesus came as an infant, so the bloodlines of all of humanity would flow through his veins. The New Testament says in Matthew chapter 1 and 1, Matthew starts this way with these words, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And then in Luke chapter 3, verse 38, Luke gives the bloodlines of Jesus Christ all the way back to Adam. And so Jesus didn't simply come just to die for us. He came to shed his blood for all of the world. And the lineage of all of the world was in his blood. Point number two is this, the miracle of the virgin birth. The miracle of the virgin birth. What child is this? What child is this? Second, through the miracle of the virgin birth, Jesus acquired a twofold nature. What do you mean by that, Pastor Tim? Well, he was fully God and fully man. He was the most unique human being ever because he was fully God and, and, and fully man simultaneously at the same time and nothing about his humanity distracted from his divinity from his godliness and nothing about his godliness distracted from his humanity and so as God Jesus has the power to save as man Jesus has the ability to provide for us salvation by dying for our sins, the sacrificial lamb. And, and only through this can Jesus be a bridge between you and me and Father God. Only through Jesus can we be reconciled back into God's family. He has come from heaven as a, um, if he had come from heaven as a grown man, then the, the, the world, mankind, would find it hard to believe his humanity. And if, if Jesus had been born of both Joseph and Mary, and not by the Virgin Mary, it would have been hard for mankind to believe that he was God. So you see, Father God kind of knew what he was doing with this plan. Point number three is this. Jesus came as a baby. Part two, I called it. Part two. What child is this? What child is this? There was another reason Jesus came as a baby. Third, Jesus came also 
as a newborn baby to fulfill the possibility of living a perfect life. Jesus lived 33 years and perfectly demonstrated righteousness and holiness before giving his life as a sinless substitute. He's lived a sinless life, fulfilling all of God's law. Even the guard that, that was there whenever Jesus died on the cross in Luke chapter 23, 47 says, Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, Certainly this man was innocent. Certainly this man was innocent. Dr. G. Campbell Morgan put it this way, the death of Christ would have been of no avail for the redemption of the world had it not been preceded by his perfect life. You see, since, since Adam, mankind has lived with this sin, with the flesh we call it, with, with this, this conscious that, that continues to tell us, dude, you're messing up. Except for Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect life, the sinless life, and his conscience is pure and, and clear and clean. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. Point number four is this. Jesus grew up as a man. He grew up as a man, and this is really important. What child is this? What child is this? Fourth, Jesus came as a baby and grew into a man, uh, just, like, just like us, grew into an adult, as he could identify every phase of our lives. Is Jesus somebody that lived 2,000 years ago and was crucified and, and died, and they put him in a, in a tomb, and, and then he rose again, and, and eventually he ascended to be with God in heaven, and now he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and, and, and is sitting there making intercession for us and doing all kinds of other things, and, and, and uh, has no earthly idea what we're going through? Does Jesus know about my problems? Does Jesus know about my temptations? Does Jesus know about how I struggle with life? Yes. Yes, the basis of all sin, Jesus was, was tempted with. So can I, whenever I'm up against the brick wall, whenever I'm finding myself struggling with life, whenever I don't know where to turn next, can I go to Jesus and say, hey, can I talk with you a minute about something? And expect an answer to come back or expect him to understand what it is that I'm praying? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because he grew into manhood. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 11 through 18 say, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell you of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation, a big word, for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, let me, let me back up, for because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus lived through everything that we experience. Well, Pastor Tim, how, I, I don't understand that. How does he know the things that I'm getting into this day and age? 
Because the basis of sin is the same. The basis of temptation is the same, and he experienced all of it. And yet, he never sinned. He knows what you're going through because he's witnessed it. Even unto death. Number five, this is the last point. Jesus grew up in a family, and this is so vitally important. What child is this? What child is this? What child is this? Fifth, Jesus came as a baby to show us the importance of families. Did he do that? Yes, he did, and he continued to do that. Before God created any other institution, he created the family. Who married him? God did. Who was it? Adam and Eve. They were husband and wife? Yeah. Yeah. The family. So how fitting would it be that baby Jesus would be born into a family? A family with, with Mary and Joseph. A family with, with siblings and other family members. You remember Elizabeth who was, was pregnant with John. And, and whenever Mary went to see her, and she walked up to Elizabeth. John leaped in Elizabeth's womb. I would imagine they had a very special connection. And it's very important to God that we understand what these, these families are like and why. Well, a family is, a godly family is one in which the husbands and the wives, the moms and the dads are pursuing Christ all the time. And, and there's only one way to make this thing work. And, and I've said it so many times before, but please indulge me one more time. I'm sure I'll say it another hundred times between now and whenever. But you have the husband over here. You have the wife over here. And the way that they grow together is what? Is by walking toward Jesus. Is by maturing their relationship with Jesus. And whenever they do that, then they walk closer together. So whenever you have a godly family where the, the husband and the wife, the mom and the dad are doing that, and they have children, and they begin to raise these children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, the fear and the instruction of God, those children are going to reflect their parents. And chances are they're going to become Christians themselves. In that family, the husband and the wife, the father and the, the mother, the children, mature. They grow up to be whole and healthy family members. And then they might go off to school. They may, they may go off to work, whatever. But whenever they leave the house... What happens? There are lights in the world around them. And they begin to influence other people. And that's just an amazing thing. But it happens. And so the family is extremely important. Let's carry it one step further. We are a family. We're the family of God. It's vitally important that this family is healthy. It's vitally important that everybody in this family walk toward a maturing relationship with Jesus Christ. Why? Because we're walking toward each other. It's vitally important that we, with our young folks, with our, our children, and in our uh, teens, that we, that we raise them in the fear and instruction of the Lord. It's vitally important that, that Pastor Cliff and myself dig and dig and dig and dig and dig and get down to the bottom of God's Word so that we're faithful in delivering God's Word expositionally to you so you have the full counsel of God. So that when you leave here, you're whole and you're healthy. And you walk out into the world around you and you're a light. 
That's why it's so important to God to have godly families. And I'm going to close with this. You know, the Christmas story is kind of like a Hallmark movie in that regardless of where you are in the world, if, if you've never heard of it, chances are somebody around you knows it. And it tugs on everybody's heart. You can't get away from it. it, it no matter where you are in the world, it's, it's going to be a significant story. Regardless of your age, young, old, it doesn't matter. It's still going to be a, a, a story that has some significance and relevance to you. And so back to the title of the sermon. What child is this? What child is this? What child is this? He's the one that the shepherds came to see and the angels sang about. He's God and man. He's Lord and Savior. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Savior and He's the judge and He's the lion and He's the lamb and He's the lover of all and the Lord of all. That's who He is. He came as a tender baby, just to recap real quickly, to share the bloodline of all humanity. He combined in Himself this twofold nature as, as He was born. Fully God, fully man. He came to demonstrate perfect righteousness and holiness in that He lived a sinless life without, without any blemishes. And He came to identify with us by facing temptation and conquering death. And He came to show us the importance of Importance of families. So, I, I opened with this. Should Christians celebrate Christmas? It's the birthday of the king. <laughs> what, what better time what better time would it be for us to receive this gift? To renew our relationship with Jesus. What better time would it be for us to be in the mindset of the Shepherds and the wise men that came and they bowed before him. In this season, regardless of all of the paganism that goes on around it, our hearts should be set on beholding him as the Savior of the world. And believing Him. And just like the shepherds did. And the wise men. When they left. Huh, we saw. The glory. The majesty. Of the Messiah. We should tell others. We should tell others. This is Christmas, and you know what I serve? <laughs> I celebrate Jesus Christ. I celebrate Jesus Christ. Why? Because it's the birthday of the King that we celebrate. A very simple story with a very significant background that will change the life of many. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for this chance for us to re to, to, to reestablish within us the importance of celebrating Christmas and sharing that with everyone that's around us. 
Thank you, Father God, for giving us this opportunity this day, this Sunday, Christmas Day, to come and be together as a family, to hear the Christmas story, to sing Christmas songs about you, to love each other, and to love you. Father God, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you for this day. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.